Welcome everyone to this session on uh, the mass responsive city, how integrating mobility services and infrastructure can contribute to better urban environments. So Urbanism Next is the first European online conference that brings all sectors of mobility and urban planning together to have a complete view on the trends, but also the challenges that lie ahead. For three days, academics, private and public sector stakeholders have shared their experience and knowledge on how to shape the future of our cities. What is more fitting to this theme than mass? In the period of changes we have all experienced, especially over the past year, mass has shown us new opportunities and models can, can, that can help push forward transportation as we know it. Urbanism Next and Polis are thrilled to bring to the floor four experts of the mobility and mass sector to hear their experiences and their perspectives. Please feel free to uh, ask your session. And I will now leave the floor to your Scott Shepherd. Thank you, Victoire. So my name is uh, Scott Shepherd, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. So the mass responsive city, and we'll be covering uh, topics pretty much related to the merging of the digital and physical infrastructure and how urban planning affects future investments in uh, mobility and how mass is an enabler for this new realm of discovery in our emergence in urbanity post COVID. So uh, what I'd like to do is kick this off today uh, with a little bit of my background and then uh, we will introduce the speakers. Uh, each one of us, the four of us will be uh, presenting uh, our presentations roughly about five to 10 minutes, one by one. So a little bit of housekeeping on that. So we'll pr probably spend about 40 minutes on our presentations, talking about different focuses of the digital and physical infrastructure and mass as an enabler for urban planning. Um, next, uh, in terms of our housekeeping, we'll spend about the next 30 minutes or so in a round table discussion amongst the four of us going through a series of questions and we'll have an interactive forum with the audience where we'll be monitoring your uh, questions and uh, comments. Uh, so please feel free to send us any questions you have to any one of us panelists in the Q&A section on the right hand side of your interface. And then finally, the last uh, 15 minutes or so, we'll wrap up with and any other questions and answers from the audience. So with that, I will start with just a brief uh, bio and intro of myself. So again, my name is Scott Shepard. I am Vice President of Global Public Sector with IMO, the Internet of Mobility. I am based in Europe, as you can hear, I'm an American. And my background is uh, 20 years of experience as an urban planner and designer with a strong emphasis in urban mobility and urban mobility technologies. My experience spans government, it spans consulting, as well as most recently in the startup ecosystem for shared mobility here in Europe, as well as North America. And I'm really excited to kind of lead this discussion and foster some really great interaction amongst the four of us today, as well as the audience members, so we can kind of co-create and learn what this new direction of urban mobility is, one, two, how mass is an enabler, and three, how urban planning, either traditional or more progressive techniques of urban planning can help, help us better achieve sustainable mobility as we emerge post COVID pandemic. So with that, I'm going to introduce our first panelist and between each panelist, I'll do the introduction to the next panelist. So I'll read through their bios. So just so you understand kind of the formatting of how I'll be kind of popping in and out here. So no one's surprised. So with our first panelist, I'd like to introduce uh, Chart Gall. And uh, Chart Gall is pursuing a PhD on the topic of developing human-centered scenarios of urban mobility futures. He is an urbanist with a strong interest in urban development, climate change impacts for urban residents, and the effective use of visualization of urban data to strengthen evidence-based decision and policy making. So with that, I would like to introduce Chart to be our first presenter today. Yes, hello everyone. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Victoire, for the introduction. So, yeah, I'm I'm based here in Paris, and I'm um, part of the Anthropolis chair. So, I'm presenting um, some of the work which we are doing here. Primarily, my colleagues uh, Mariana Reis, Marigal, and uh, Jakob Buchinger. And I want to start with a really short um, introduction, just to talk a little bit about what really important parts of Mars are. 
but also what are some of the potentials, but of course also the challenges and things which still need um, a lot of work. And I want to start with um, questioning the first word of mobility as a service, because mobility is something which is defined very differently across different fields. And when we talk about mobility as a service, we have to think about what kind of mobility we want to achieve, because sometimes it's just, um, let's say, applied for automotive, um, automotive discourses or for particular types of mobility. A lot of times, mobility is reduced to those who are in the city centers and who just have a little bit more comfortable way of integrating all the different ways. But mobility can, or mobility as a service, can be much more, which really integrates the, the improvement and the access of mobility in, sub, in rural areas and peri-urban areas and so on. So I think it's, it's very important to, to conceptualize mass in a, in a broader sense and consider what is part of it, but also what we're trying to do with mass. So yeah, as I said before, one part is just trying to make life more comfortable for people to switch between the metro, their car, the rental cars and the scooters in the city, which is nice, of course, but I think um, there are a lot of parts which we can do as well, which is trying to shift, for example, from less sustainable to more sustainable modes, um, trying to increase the financial um, efficiency, try to improve the overall optimization or try to optimize the overall transportation systems, decrease commuting travel times and so on. But each of these parts has a lot of impacts. So mass can be in the simplest form. It can just make life a little bit easier, but in a more advanced version, it can change a lot of things. And then when we are talking about how to integrate mass in the cities of today, we have to be aware what a change. Let's say to just give one example, if we manage to cut down the, the commuting times from everyone by two, let's say, which is very unrealistic, but let's say we would be able to do so. Um, that would mean that people could live much further away and there would be much more time for other things and other trips which would be taken. So just this as a little um, starting point. And then the second part is what is mass and what it isn't. And a lot of times, I think we will have some discussions on this as well. Uh, mass is just seen as the application you have on your smartphone to access different kinds of types of mobility. But mass is much more to that. And what I like to um, refer to in this case is uh, the pyramid which talks about the different levels of mobility as a service. So in the in the most normal sense, and this is, I think, what um, we have in most places today, you have different independent solutions. I think I have about 18 apps or something for mobility on my phone, which most of them don't do what I want them to do. So this is a reality in many places around the world. At the first level of mass, you can do planning. So you can plan between different modes of um, transportation. And the second one, you see the prices, so you know which take, which paths you can take, which transport um, modes you can take, but also how much you will pay for it. In the third level, it gets already very difficult because there the ticketing part becomes um, or enters the discussion. That means you can buy with a single solution all the different parts. I think probably Scott will talk about that also in a, at a latest part. And the last one, and this is also where it becomes interesting when we're talking about sustainable urban um, development, we can use it to, for example, create incentives to shift towards more sustainable modes or encourage some parts or encourage others. So in the reality, however, I think we are still struggling in many, many places with the first level. The second level starts to work in some places. The third one, there are a couple of pilots and a couple of projects which um, work, but it's been a long way and we are still um, struggling with some basics. And what we are working on um, at the Antipolis Chair um, is a couple of different parts of um, with the business models which can work um, with the open ecosystems and so on but what we are really trying to start with is the the definition that it's not just about um, making it accessible but really having a focus on the integration the improve uh, the provision of improved access and to use it also as a means to catalyze sustainable mobility practice so these are the three three elements. And then we had, um, I think one month or two months ago, we had our colloquium here and Mars was one of the sessions with a lot of speakers. Um, I will also have a report um, at the end of the slides where you see the link. And there was a lot of interesting discussions about, okay, how can we make it work? But the point which um, really stick to my mind was that um, from one of the keynote speakers, Maxime, uh, Maxime Adouin, that we don't, mass doesn't just solve something by itself. We need to have the right mobility infrastructure in the first place. We need to have the right modes of mobility. We need to have everything kind of set up and we cannot just put uh, a mass solution somewhere and say, okay, it's going to solve or replace other parts. And in that sense, um, 
I would say the, the most important is to have a, the right basis. So that's the physical infrastructures, road, rails, whatever. But also, and that relates to the urban planning part, the land use, the regional urban development planning, and so on and so on. Um, the next part is whatever happens on it. And that is on the one side, the very practical, let's say, transportation management. But it is also the availability of data, the APIs, the open ecosystem, the standards, the regulation, which is behind it. And then if those two things are there or working more or less, then we can talk about um, how we can go from the different levels of mass. And that, of course, doesn't mean that just because we don't have the perfect infrastructure yet, we cannot have mass solutions already. But mass, the, the, upper, the, the highest level of mass integration will not replace one of the others. And then just to point out two, three key challenges, um, which I think are for me interesting to discuss also today is the role of the private and the public sector because um, we have the public transportation um, operators we have a lot of private actors i think just before covid uh, really started that there are a lot of more actors in each of the the cities so who is responsible for the platform who owns who manages the data um, who chooses which modes are proposed for example if i now use my uh, google maps here I always um, see that I can use my uh, small scooter or something for a distance which I could walk without a problem. So there are there are choices which are made from each of the platforms depending on on their partnerships, on their interests, and so on. And this is something where I would say the challenges between the the regulation from the public side and the cooperation between the private and the public side. And uh, another part is the discussion between centralized and decentralized. So will there be one solution which the, the winner takes it all scenario and um, which rules everyone, which is either public or private? Or is there a new app for each city, for each district? So we have to download a million of apps on our phone and always have to navigate to them. Or do we manage to create an open and effective ecosystem? And for that, um, I think in France, there's just very recently, um, let's say the, the starting point or the foundation is set. And in the Netherlands, there's a really nice project called the City Data Standard for Mobility. So there are a lot of projects at the moment which are trying to build the, the basis for that. And with that, just to sum it up, um, I believe mass is, has incredibly great potential, but it's not a magical pull. It's not going to replace something which, um, which has to be built first. Um, the quality of the mobility infrastructures defines the success in any case. And mass in itself is value free. So we can use it for whatever we want. And we have to see how we can use it to make it more sustainable, more accessible, more um, inclusive. And the challenge and the problem which we have today is to govern the balance between local, global, and public private. And that's not something which can be solved, but it's what we have to do next. And with that, I'll just leave this here. Thank you very much. And I will hand it back to Scott. All right. Thank you, Tiark, for your first presentation, kind of laying the foundation for the levels of mass, how that affects the urban uh, environment, as well as description on the layers of digital and physical infrastructure. So that was really informative, and I appreciate that. And that segues pretty well into my presentation. I've already introduced myself, so I won't do that again. <laughs> so let me share my screen. I'll keep my part brief because I want to give it enough time for uh, the rest of uh, the panelists and the audience for a good exchange of information. So I will uh, share my screen now and we'll get started. And the title of my presentation, let me make sure this is presenting correctly here, is Urban Planning and Mass for Sustainable Mobility. So with that, we will start. So I'd just like to kind of set the stage and take a little bit more of an academic definition of what is urban planning and then really kind of understand how that relates into more of the, the policies, the procedures, and uh, that layers in with how mass can be innate an enabler for these uh, better possibilities and uh, more desired outcomes. So as you all may or may not be aware, urban planning, also known as regional planning, is a political process and a technical process that is focused on the development and design of land use in the built environment, including all layers, air, water, infrastructure, et cetera, as such as transportation, communications, and distribution networks. So 
let's pause for a moment. Why is urban planning important for mass and sustainable mobility? There's kind of three layers of importance of why we're seeing a convergence of the policy level, the governance level, as well as the digital level and how these are affecting uh, better outcomes for mobility as we move forward. One is striking a balance between public and private transport expenditures. So actual uh, capital budgets on infrastructure related to rail networks, related to cycle paths, related to uh, essentially uh, public access to mobility itself. That's one area of interest that urban planning is very important in this domain. The second domain is finding a balance, as Chark talked about before, between regulation and private ordering regimes. So what are the roles of the different actors in the mobility ecosystem related to urban planning and related to mass? Who does what? And what are the levels of control to kind of strike a better equilibrium for shared mobility and better access to mobility options? So again, an interesting point before I get to the final point here is uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, paradigms shifting and broken in the mobility ecosystem in light of COVID meaning that uh, some of the traditional metrics for success in uh, public transport as well as mobility in general will just are basically uh, key performance indicators of ridership. And what we're seeing right now is more of qualitative indicators of access, access to mobility from a geographic as well as qualitative standpoint and how all citizens have equal access, so equitability, and access to mobility and how the digital and physical infrastructure layers such as Chark talked about before can enable these better outcomes. Next is a balance. So striking a balance between private MSPs, mobility service providers, and public mass transport. And this has always been a source of friction and competition up until COVID because each individual operator, each individual mode, for better or worse, may have been fearful of competition and sharing riders and passengers. So we're trying to kind of blend into much more of a uh, balance and an ecosystem towards multimodality. So this, at least here in mainland Europe, comes down to the construct at the local and the regional level of SOMS, Sustainable Urban Mobility Plans, which are the mechanism, the vehicle to achieve sustainable urban mobility from a policy and planning perspective through an orderly process of procedures, administrations, and approved plans that align with capital budgets and infrastructure for better outcomes related to uh, digital and physical mobility. So there's multiple milestones and uh, I would say measures of success that are laid out in some that are kind of encompassed in this one slide, but I'll go through those a bit more in the next uh, slide here. So. We're gonna take a step back for a second, showing a nice graphic here, planning for the sustainable city. What are sustainable mobility plans? So there's four central components. One is it's a strategic plan designed to satisfy the mobility needs of people and businesses. So this is similar to a long range strategic plan that urban planners such as myself worked on for many years in the, in the United States. And typically in a long range strategic plan in the US, trying to compare and contrast US urban planning to European urban planning is, this would be a transportation or an urban mobility chapter in a long range strategic plan. What's different in Europe though, is that these are targeted plans specifically for urban mobility that span across multiple domains, using mobility as kind of the central nexus for stitching together all of these sustainable outcomes versus more of a generalist urban plan that we see a bit more in the pr practitioner realm for uh, certified urban planners in the United States. So that's a bit of the nuance and difference in a SUMP versus kind of a US-based urban plan. Second, it builds upon existing planning practices and takes into due, due consideration integration participation and evaluation processes, which is pretty, that's a universal process across urban planning, whether um, Sebastian will be speaking uh, after me, his uh, strong experience in uh, China and Asia and other markets. There's a lot of universal principles in urban planning, so I won't get into that. Next, uh, SUMPs have been designed to tackle transport related problems in urban areas more efficiently. So again, transport and mobility is the nexus that stitches across all these different domains and layers, whether it's public health, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's um, 
economic development, et cetera, et cetera. And that is the common thread, which is a bit different than I would say American uh, urban planning. Next, the, the fourth, uh, you know, um, I would say a bullet point that is a part of the sustainable urban mobility plans domain is there a structured process where visions are created, objectives and targets are set and policies are selected in active communication. So again, utilizing that traditional urban planning outreach and stakeholder communication process, but with a, uh, a specific lens towards uh, sustainable mobility. So uh, some principles and actions. So we'll just go through these really quickly here. So one is just planning for sustainable mobility in the functional cities. So the real life cities, we're not talking about the futuristic utopian city, but uh, living, breathing, working cities and how uh, sustainable mobility can be uh, wedded into the existing infrastructure and blended over time for the benefit of all citizens. Next is developing a long-term vision and a clear implementation plan. Again, using standard urban planning and design practices. Again, some of these are a bit re repetitious from before assessing current and future performance, developing all transport modes in an integrated manner. So that's important because again, this comes back to this concept of, of multimodality and how each private and public transportation mode plays off each other in aggregate for better access for all citizens so that they all have uh, better equitability so that they can move around the city in a more sustainable fashion. So better cooperation across institutional boundaries. This is certainly important here in Europe at the multiple levels of governments and having more of a cohesive and comprehensive view towards uh, urban mobility uh, involving citizens, relevant stakeholders. We talked about that. And then the other points here. And then I won't go through these, but it, basically the principles are all interwoven in terms of the SUMP framework for urban planning as applied to mobility as a service. So mobility as a service is basically a tool set or enabler that basically pushes the uh, concepts and the outcomes of sustainable urban mobility plans into action. So you can think of mass as that digital enabler, that digital layer of infrastructure that allows for better outcomes multimodality. So specifically, I don't want to repeat what uh, Chark had previously uh, presented in terms of the levels of integration of mass, but just as a conceptual value chain of how mass is constructed, the different uh, actors and I would say elements in this kind of concept, because mass can take many different, I would say, uh, iterations and flavors, whether it's business to consumer, business to government, et cetera, et cetera. And the main components are you have a, uh, uh, a layer of transportation operators, whether they public and private, they integrate with a mass integrator. The mass integrator basically assembles all the information, data and service into a mass provider. The mass provider sometimes could be the same as the mass integrator. You have two different le levels, but let's say the mass provider is typically the consumer facing app, whether it's a white label app or some type of in website or interface where the consumer can actually plan, book, uh, pay and, um, uh, construct their multimodal journey. And then of course you have the consumer themselves or customer in this case. So how can urban planning and mass achieve sustainable mobility? So there's four different elements to that to achieve these, uh, achieve these better outcomes post COVID because we're seeing a shift in essentially temporary as well as now long-term physical infrastructure changes in the built environment, whether they be pop up bike lanes, whether they be open streets, whether they be outdoor dining, whether they be uh, essentially uh, cycling paths and pedestrian infrastructure that one initially in the emergency crisis mode of, of COVID tried to um, address a public health issue, let's say for social distancing, but now it's becoming to be seen very clearly for urbanists such as myself, Sebastian, Chark and Carlos, that these are all basically completely consistent with long range policies related to sustainable urban mobility. And those four components, like I talked about before, are sustainable urban plans, public and private shared mobility suppliers. So that's very key is having a sufficient supply to create a uh, healthy and sustainable mix for all citizens related to access and equity, having your mass and shared mobility data insights available for the public and private sector. And certainly let's say for the public sector, shared mobility data insights, 
that are uh, GDPR compliant here in Europe and that are anonymized and aggregated that can be used for uh, public officials. So urban planners, policymakers, and other administrators so they can gain a better dashboard insight to the behaviors as well as positioning of different modes of mobility to basically make better decisions related to their uh, future infrastructure and uh, policy goals. And then finally, which is a bit of a repeat from before, is public sector policy and governance flows from the data insights, flows from the supply of, of uh, mobility providers, as well as the long range mobility plans, the SUPs. So just kind of moving along here, using mass data, so uh, data from a mass or shared mobility ecosystem helps improve urban planning and policy along three fronts. It does in terms of enabling better equity. It does in terms of enabling better safety in the public realm, the public right of way. And it informs better urban planning and policy for just in terms of environment and finding the right mode and mobility mix to better uh, distribute the different um, uh, suppliers in a fashion that affects uh, better, um, I would say, uh, environmental and sustainability goals. Uh, just a quick use case here in New York City, how mass contributes to accelerated uptake of alternatives to inadequate public transport services. So it's kind of a uh, cyclical fashion. So we can see here on the upper left-hand side, increased investments of mass uh, providers and TSPs increases attractiveness of TSPs uh, and it accelerates growth of private operators into platforms. It increases private incentivization opportunities which also increases better customer loyalty for either private operators or mass ecosystems, as well as increasing contribution margins, so commercial opportunities into these platforms. So the purpose of this slide is to uh, depict how mass is essentially a bi-directional ecosystem. It's not simply a consumer-facing app, but it's a marketplace of mobility services, public and private, that can be offered through a number of consumer facing applications that increase ridership, increase access to transportation, as well as um, I would say um, promote multimodality where all different operators in this ecosystem uh, cumulatively benefit. So it's not a zero sum game or as we Americans say, a winner take all. It's, it's mutually beneficial and it grows as a network ecosystem over time. And we're starting to see mass evolve into that ecosystem uh, as we move forward, one. And then two, we're starting to see how mass uh, can benefit the public sector and benefit uh, urban planning in the uh, physical public realm. Um, so this is the typical mass model, which is just a business to consumer model as we're starting to kind of pivot away from that uh, moving forward kind of in business models and consumer facing applications. And like I just spoke about before, what we're seeing is an emergence of much more of an open mobility marketplace. So we can call that mass 2.0, mass 3.0, which is much more of this open concept where you have an ecosystem of providers and perhaps the, the mass level of service or mobility providers is actually offered in a range of uh, mobility applications and interfaces for consumers. Uh, use case here is a project that we're working on at IMO, which is in the Skona region in southern Sweden, which is basically uh, the use case uh, in terms of an open mobility marketplace is supercharging an existing app. And this existing app is a consumer facing public transport mobile ticketing app for Skona traffic in, in Malmo, Sweden. And what we are doing is inserting our mobile API and SDK into their app to create an open mobility marketplace for a seamless door-to-door -door solution. So we resolve a lot of the frictions in multimodality. And that allows for an experience for basically achieving at least level three to level four masses, which what Chark talked about previously. And with that, I think that is the end of my presentation. So I still have the floor here for one moment and I'm going to introduce our next speaker. And our next speaker is uh, Sebastian Gethels. Sebastian is an urban planner, architect and urban mobility entrepreneur from Belgium that has worked globally on the physical and digital transformation of urban environments with a people-centered approach. He has founded City Links in Shanghai, China, and in Rotterdam, Netherlands, to build multi multidisciplinary teams working on the integration of mobility systems, 
design innovation, seamless intermodality, gamification, and urban governance at various levels in China, Europe, and Africa. So with that, I would like to introduce Sebastian as our next speaker. Thank you, Scott. Thanks a lot for your nice introduction. So um, yeah, I will uh, take uh, this time to just um, follow up on, on what Chuck and Scott explained uh, on this complex uh, interaction between mass and actually the city where we live. And um, well, I would like to have a, maybe an explorative approach uh, to see how actually digital integration of mass and actually urban mobility modes in general could uh, impact in a good way potentially uh, the physical integration and actually the public space in, a, in our cities. Um, so the, um, yes, next slide. Uh, first thing, well, sustainable urban mobility is one thing that is quite new, let's say after the 20th century really oriented to car oriented development and now we are more and more increasingly uh, conscious about uh, the space we have gradually uh, given uh, to, to transportation uh, especially motorized transportation and now we we, we actually realize um, how much space we can get back from it and at the same time well while we want to uh, shift to a healthier mobility and lifestyle in our cities we have also this digitization happening and also this idea that proximity should uh, actually contribute to our to the improvement of our, our lifestyle so uh, all of these trends are happening together and now that the covid happened actually the the, the digitized view of uh, how how we use space and time in our city has increased so uh, this is this is a actually complex mobility revolution I want to explore. Um, yes. So in terms of uh, uh, well, urban mobility revolution in time and space, we have several trends here. Well, first, as I said, is digitization. Digitization um, gives us to to everyone, uh, to transport providers, but to, to consumers to commuters uh, access to real-time information to to understand to build knowledge uh, of the space we are using and the way we are moving from a to b and we are more and more realizing that actually we could live in a different way um, and of course it has been exacerbated uh, during the last year the last month and then we have this world sharing economy trend which of course applies to, to mobility and to mobility as a service, to mass, uh, where all kinds of vehicles are now available without the need to own them. Um, and it also uh, transforms our relationship to space because, uh, well, originally in the 20th century, a few years ago, actually, we we're still thinking um, very traditionally as like opposing uh, pedestrian space to uh, uh, traffic, uh, space for traffic and space for bicycles. But actually the, this, this very uh, black and white uh, approach is actually becoming more and more diluted uh, from the, the, this idea of shared use mobility to shared streets, to sharing streets. And uh, when we actually ha are more informed about how to, how to commute, how to move from A to B, we can actually together, potentially, I say, uh, becoming uh, smarter communities and potentially give more space uh, to human beings, to nature and, and actually to, to, to life in the city. So the thing is, um, well, mass is actually one kind of, uh, new services or new layer added on the existing mobility ecosystem. We had public transportation, we had bicycles, we, we, have, we have pedestrianity, okay, we have walkability, we have a lot of parking space, of course, and then MAS is bringing an additional layer. It's bringing solutions, it's bringing new problems as well. Um, so the thing is, uh, it's not actually a revolution in itself. It's just 
uh, well, uh, uh, another step of the evolution of mobility. So it all depends uh, on how cities and how communities will manage this additional layer uh, to see the actual impact on cities. And this will be very different from one city to, to another because consumption of, of space really depends on how the city will integrate uh, all the, tra the transport mode together and how intermodality will happen. So the thing is, um, when we provide a new service or a new tool, a new technology, what is happening is that uh, we provide new forms of solutions, but we also create some new trend of induced demand. It's like, well, when the car appeared, we had the, the possibility to reach further places in a, in a, in a quickest time. And now that we have mobility as a service, uh, whatever it's uh, bikes or scooters or, or cars, we have actually more options and we also have more options to consume space with it. Um, and what happened, for example, in China, you, you can see here on the picture, is that all those uh, uh, shared use bicycle providers were competing with each other and there was no consensus on how space, public space, sidewalks, roads, uh, should be used for this this new uh, kind of vehicle, connected vehicle, and uh, what demand happened with the car, but in a different way, of course, because at that stage there was no integrated urban mobility governance. There was no consensus on who will manage that and who will uh, actually find the balance between all those new competitors uh, on the road. So the thing is uh, now uh, actually uh, I'm, I'm working on, 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 on potential uh, pilot projects. Uh, this one is in China, it's in Shanghai, where actually we would like to see how uh, at, a, at a really uh, narrow down level, at, at a limited uh, space level, so it's just one street, uh, how we could integrate in, in the, the best way possible uh, all those new modes of mobility, starting with people, of course, uh, walking around, and then uh, by, uh, shared use bicycle and just private bicycles, and how uh, they, they integrate with each, each other uh, on, on sidewalks, on roads, etc. And then how we can uh, gradually uh, push back private vehicles to uh, just only rely on intermodality between public transport, mass and walkability. And so those three components all together, uh, well, there is another component about urban logistics, but low impact urban logistics, um, could actually, if well integrated, create quality urban space where mobility happens in a smooth way without conflict. Of course, this is the kind of uh, perfect wall we, we, we would like to see, but actually it never happens like that. It happens like step by step. Uh, we, we, we pilot, we try, and then we pivot to something different. So, so that's, that's what happens always when, when, when we plan and design uh, the space in the city. But uh, the idea is, is to, to see if uh, actually people that are using those mobility services uh, can connect to potentially more citizen responsibilities by um, using, using this, um, this, this digital ecosystem of mobility to, 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 to potentially reinvest uh, their, their spending into something uh, that, that will promote better public spaces. So, um, yes, on, on the next slide, we can see actually um, that, well, this is in China, uh, you can see that actually there are systems like uh, Alipay uh, that provides options uh, and, and gains actually gamification uh, to, to reinvest uh, some part of the of the cost or the price we pay into uh, some tree planting or green space uh, investing 
to actually compensate uh, or the carbon footprint of what we are doing. It's not only related to transport, but it can be uh, by uh, actually investing in one tree in a specific location. So we try to actually apply this model to, um, uh, to, to the integration between mass consumption and uh, green space crowdfunding. Um, so, well, of course, it's better to, to, to work at the pilot project scale, like looking at, a, looking at a, a street first. It can work for a few urban blocks. Uh, it's very difficult to apply that at, at the city level, but with the urban governance improving and the integrative uh, transport management improving, we, we can actually uh, reach uh, better results. So here you can see a street where this is in New York, actually, where you can see that almost 80% of the, of the space uh, is dedicated to traffic, to motorized traffic, and then you still have car parking space. And in the end, uh, uh, space for people, for pedestrians, is just the remaining space that we, we, we didn't use for traffic. Uh, so, so the idea is to say that if we integrate uh, the best way possible, um, all those modes together, we can actually rationalize uh, uh, the, the space used for traffic and give more space for uh, the rest, actually, which is not only mobility, but we, which is actually a healthier lifestyle, potentially. So, yeah, you, you can see here, um, actually, the, the transformation happening here uh, uh, through this video. Um, well, when we start to uh, integrate pedestrian space with autonomous mobility, shared youth bicycle, and no more private traffic, no more private vehicle, we can actually uh, potentially reach for, for this kind of street, 24% uh, only uh, dedicated to traffic, while we have gained space for all kinds of different kinds of function. And this is actually uh, in line with the 15-minute city, where actually the, the, the urban space is much more attractive to, to use uh, lower carbon uh, mobility modes. And actually, urban functions can start actually to be also more mixed and uh, with more proximity between uh, uh, each other. So, so walkability increase, and the 15-minute city also uh, becomes uh, more like a, a reality. So th this is a bit of reflection on how actually we can integrate uh, mass and, and this sustainable mobility thinking and governance and also crowdfunding and citizen engagement. Um, so thank you. I will um, uh, leave the floor to, well, Scott first and then Carlos, uh, which, which, which will jump in the universe of uh, autonomous vehicles and what it means for cities. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Sebastian, for that. I appreciate your uh, presentation. That was very informative, talking about specific use cases. I like the gamification use case in China. That was interesting. And just kind of learning a little bit more about how we can put this into practice for getting citizens more engaged in uh, digital technologies that can uh, better enable uh, sustainable mobility outcomes. So. Next, I am going to introduce our final panelist uh, before we have our round table. And our next panelist is Carlos Holquin. Carlos is co-founder and president of Suburban, an autonomous minivan supplier for suburban municipalities. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in Product Design and a Master of Science in Urban Planning and Mobility from the Ponce Paris Tech Engineering School. He has worked on the user experience, design, and urban integration of autonomous vehicles in the public transport system since 2004. So with that, I would like to introduce Carlos as our next speaker. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, just uh, confirm that, uh, please, that uh, you can see my screen. And then we can proceed. Uh, so when, uh, I, actually we've seen uh, through, the, through the whole conference and the different presentations, starting with Shark, that uh, mass requires um, a physical layer. And actually, um, after the, the COVID, the, the pandemic, um, autonomous vehicles were very much into question 
uh, on, uh, on, on regards to their applicability and their usefulness uh, when all the, uh, let's say, pop-up bike uh, lanes uh, spread out uh, throughout cities. So I wanted to give um, a little overview of uh, where we think and why we do what we do uh, of uh, the application of autonomous vehicles. As Scott mentioned, I've been uh, working on, on the vehicles in cities since 2004, so uh, a while ago. Um, and, uh, and I've seen um, some kind of all the evolution that, that this uh, this kind of system that was in initially science fiction uh, past that, years, yeah. which is really interesting. Um, and I use in, in my presentation the word metropolitan because urban, uh, actually, um, the word urban limits us to, to kind of the, the dense parts of cities, but cities are also made of uh, uh, suburbs, as also Chark uh, mentioned. Um, and actually, it's very tempting. Oh, I see my my slides don't show very well uh it's very tempting to think that basically that really um, um the um, uh, metropolitan mobility will look like this after the pandemic uh let me get back oh sorry i don't know why it's not showing properly uh, to restart this the sharing technical issue Okay, now it should be better. Um, yeah, it's tempting to think that um, people will uh, ha have switched to back and uh, everything. But uh, uh, this, this is just. just... Sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I guess we have a small technical issue, but maybe it would be a good time to invite you again to also say a couple of words in the chat and ask your questions. So we have something to start with as soon as we go to the Q&A. But I think you... Sorry, <laughs> some connection problem. Uh... Okay, so hopefully the, we will interrupt, uh, we'll not be interrupted again. Um, so I, I was mentioning that um, probably it's, it's tempting to think that post COVID to cars, to, to bikes, but actually part of the reality is also like this. So uh, this kind of traffic jams is uh, actually our office is based on the suburbs of Paris. And uh, this is what we see uh, when we go to the office every day on the motorway. It's a huge uh, queues of, uh, of congestion in, in, the, uh, in the motorway going into the city center. Uh, and this is uh, something I, I, I think is a, is a kind of a, um, neglected or uh, blind spot on, on uh, new mobility services, actually. Let me try to restart. Uh, so, sorry, again. Okay, uh, yeah, as I said, uh, new mobility services like sharing, uh, scooter sharing, car sharing, all these new services are, are mainly focused on uh, on the city centers, and and actually suburbs have kind of the blind spot, and and actually the the picture we saw before is uh, is due to the fact that uh, suburbs have uh, very poor uh, mobility services, and 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 are often neglected even especially for from private uh, transport operators. Um, um, so, actually, where do autonomous uh, vehicles fit in, in this uh, metropolitan mobility services? Uh, sorry for the, <laughs> for the partial picture. Um, well, uh, actually, I'd like to, uh, to a little bit the... 
uh, uh, the concept of tools. Um, let me again take my presentation. Because autonomous vehicles that, that you have seen and probably you think of uh, shuttles or uh, uh, robot taxis or things like this, and autonomous vehicles is, I uh, like to, to say, that it's just a combination of uh, an automated driving system, which is the, the, let's say, the thing, the system that replaces the driver, uh, combined to any type of road vehicle uh, and uh, serving a specific transport need. Uh, which is, which can be for passengers or for goods. So uh, as an example, um, oh, again, doesn't show properly. Sorry. Uh, this is this is where our office is in the in the suburbs of Paris. Of course, this this picture doesn't mean much to you, but uh, actually the um, the center part of Paris is is right here, and we are like uh, 13 kilometers uh, from there into the suburb so this is the the inner suburb area and the rest is the uh, is, uh which kind of uh, the picture i showed earlier and um, and actually when the the reason uh one of the reasons that could explain the the traffic jam picture that you saw before is that people uh when when you want to go into paris uh from the suburb actually uh, the options you have is, uh, is to uh, public transport provides uh, one hour and 22 minutes of travel time. Uh, whereas uh, the, by car, you, it will take uh, 22 to 50 minutes, just in this specific case, but it's just an example. Uh, basically, this means that the car, even with congestion, is, is a better uh, option for, for commuters. Um, but if we look at the, the closest uh, railway station that we have uh, nearby, uh, actually 32 minutes. So it's actually competitive in terms of travel time with the car. Uh, but uh, it means that basically we have like 50 minutes added on from, from this station suburb. Uh, and, and actually, uh, but the the train is uh, right now an existing system that is competitive with the car uh so back to my picture of the server so sorry for the uh, partial image uh but basically we have already part of the solution in commuter railway uh to provide uh, mobility for for suburban areas um but if we go back to the to our to our map Actually, we are just seven minutes away from that uh, railway station. So uh, actually, uh, it's, it, you can switch, you can uh, provide some kind of service uh, that replaces a 50 minutes uh, public transport uh, trip uh, uh, currently with a seven minute trip. Uh, and that system is, is actually what we're building. So we, it, which is um, an autonomous minivan. So that would, uh, allow people to to reach that uh that commuter railway station to uh in in just seven minutes um, sorry i'm re retaking my my presentation uh to be able to to reach that railway station and use actually public transport and la leave the car at home um uh, so when when you when i ask uh, which autonomous vehicles uh fit in metropolitan uh, mobility, actually, uh, my best answer would be those which reduce uh, car dependence, actually. Um, as, as we saw throughout all the, all the presentations, the goal is really to, uh, is, is not to use ma mass for mass or, or whatever, it's, it's, it's to actually um, provide better solutions so that uh, the, um, urban mobility and metropolitan mobility becomes more sustainable. And uh, the ideal autonomous vehicle in a city should be a supplement of traditional public transport. So actually uh, dense parts of, of the cities where there are plenty of, uh, of mobility uh, are, are already well, well served. So they don't need uh, an extra autonomous vehicle to 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 provide uh, additional mobility there's there are all already plenty of, of options uh what cities should be focusing on to uh, let's say on the on the deployment of autonomous vehicle is actually to um uh, 
traditional public transport uh, in, in areas where actually there isn't any. Uh, where you can, uh, let's say, go up to the mass uh, levels and integrate those uh, both from the uh, travel planning and, uh, and rates and then uh, uh, hopefully uh, full integration of, of the, in, into the mobility system of the city. So um, that would be all for me. Uh, thanks a lot for, for the technical issues we had. Scott, you're muted. Scott, you're muted. <laughs> oh, see, another technical issue. <laughs> I think we're all having technical issues today. I, I had to pop in and out, uh, you know, to restart my computer. I know the audience doesn't want to hear all the mechanics of it, but. Uh, uh, you know, this is the trials and tribulations of our COVID world here. Hopefully we're going to be out of this and back to in person at some point soon. But anyway, thank you, Carlos, for your uh, presentation on kind of more, uh, I would say, futuristic autonomy in the built environment, as well as how mass uh, basically provides a ecosystem of providers, whether it be autonomous shuttles, whether it be demand response transit, other use cases that can fit into this bi-directional or multi-directional marketplace and ecosystem. So I think with that, I don't know if we have any uh, other questions in the Q&A right now. Chiarp, it looks like you've been fielding those. So if the audience is okay, jump in at any time here. I think we have plenty of time now. Let's see, we're at uh, 1220. Uh, we could probably segue into more of the quote unquote uh, scripted um, questions that we have amongst the four of us. So I will be your um, facilitator or moderator in asking these questions that the four of us have kind of carefully curated, shall we say. Uh, these are burning questions that we're very interested in. And we think the audience will gain a lot of uh, value from our interaction discussion too. So with that, uh, let's, let's kick this uh, section off of our presentation here. And with the first question, what we're gonna try to do is with each question, each one of us, respond and provide a bit of interaction and our own viewpoints on that. So I am going to start by asking the first question um, to Sebastian, uh, which is his question, and then we'll kind of do a little bit of a, a round table here. So Sebastian, um, first question to you is how can we use digital, how can we use digital integration of maps as an opportunity to improve the quality of life, quality of public spaces and infrastructure for mobility in our cities? Well, thank you. Thank you, Scott, for <laughs> this question. Uh, actually, yeah, I would like to, to say, it was just to complete uh, what I was talking about just a, a few minutes earlier. Uh, we are all decision makers. Actually, when we talk about urban governance, when we talk about the way a city should manage its transportation system, uh, well, the city is made of people that make decision to know, to define how to, how much parking space to, to let in the city center, uh, how much cars should enter the city and, and what kind of policy and what kind of tools we will use. And then we as, um, let's say people, commuters, uh, people moving around, uh, you, you, you can call us uh, as you want. Uh, we are also making our own decisions. But what is happening now with digitization is that uh, decisions are monitored, uh, let's say monitored and, and available, kind of available. I mean, data informed tools exist and we have more and more access to information so we are more and more able to make responsible decisions thanks to digitization. We could also not care about it, but we can uh, actually, as a, as a community of people living in the same space, we can make better decisions based on the knowledge which is provided online on a smartphone uh, or, or on an app. And uh, in the end, actually create a better mobility for everyone. But it's, it's a question of behavior and it's a question of governance. Behavior at the, the individual level and of governance at the, at the um, uh, well, local government level. And then there are all those um, 
uh, steps in between, um, well, transport operators, mobility service providers, um, and, uh, and of course, companies, industries, and so on. So um, once we have all this ecosystem integrated uh, with uh, data-informed tools, we can start to think about how to uh, actually engage citizen, build potentially public participation tools and gam gamification, for example, to make it nice, to make it a bit more fun, um, to actually see how people um, uh, ca can actually improve communities, can improve by themselves um, the public space, the streets, the roads, by giving them their advice or their opinion, but in a more uh, maybe a rational way or integrated way. It's not just like the, the city, the cities or the local government's decision against the people's reaction that are against it. Now, there is a kind of um, diluted communication, diluted information that will potentially make um, better, uh, better solutions for the city possible because we are better informed and it goes gradually. So uh, citizen engagement, public participation could improve actually the way intermodality is implemented in the space, intermodality between, between the bike, the train, the car, and of course the pedestrian. Um, the, this is not just uh, like decisions to be made in silos, but potentially a, a more natural, a more uh, incremental process uh, to, to, to be implemented. So of course, this, this is terra incognita, so we could probably have many issues also with those new possibilities, but it, it was to try it. And, and actually, uh, yeah, it would be nice to have this kind of pilot uh, uh, project implemented or at, at least tried it. Thank, thank you, Sebastian. I'm, I'm a bit more uh, positive about the outcomes and the possibilities in the future. And it's interesting you mentioned um, kind of stakeholder engagement. Uh, because uh, really that uh, falls under the framework, and I think the four of us would probably agree with this, is more the democratization of the political process and the, the democratization of the urban planning process. So while urban planning is a professional discipline and it uh, follows uh, strict guidelines and uh, policies and procedures, um, it has certainly over the last you know 75 years or so, um, it is highly politicized, but is also... Um, uh, decoupled from uh, the actual uh, citizenry in a aspect where um, it can be perceived as uh, more uh, top-down or not as integrated with the average um, population. And uh, stakeholder outreach is certainly an interesting aspect of urban planning and policy when you layer in the desired outcomes of equity uh, as well as access, etc. And I think that uh, there is a possibility to uh, gain better access and insights for um, local stakeholders and the general population to actually inform uh, more desired better outcomes, whether it be tactical urbanism at the very localized level or at the, the uh, regional level where citizenry can actually interact and uh, provide uh, their uh, needs and desires in uh, what is their preferred uh, modes and levels of travel and behavior as we emerge uh, post-pandemic. Now, <clears throat> my desire was to field this question to all four of you, so I apologize, Carlos and Tiark, I'm not, but we have to give our audience the foremost uh, priority in engagement. So now we have a whole uh, we have a whole line of questions from the audience that are coming in right now. I think it would be best for us to interact directly with the audience. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each one of these questions and try to pose that to the three of you. I may or not answer a question myself, but let's do our best right now. So I'm going to go with the the uh, first question here on the list from Anonymous. Uh, and I'll ask Tiark this question, which is um, for you, Tiark. Is the public sector ready to tackle mass? Part one. Part two is how can the private sector help local authorities without leading to a privatization of the sector? That's a great question. I, I grapple with that all the time myself. So I'm going to give that good question, two part question to you, Tiark. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, if I would have an answer to this question, I would be very happy, but I will still uh, share some thoughts on it. And I think it's also nice because it uh, coincides a lot with what we have been discussing before as well. And I think that's uh, 
It really depends on the different parts because some countries are definitely much more advanced in the sense of how they are prepared for everything on the level of how they are they're organizing it. Or just take the, the French example again. I think here has been a lot of uh, restructuring of the different responsibilities over time. And it's something which I think moves into the right direction that the, the capability is there. But um, at the same time, of course, you have the very strong private um, private elements. And that's something which I was thinking about, Carlos, when you're presenting. Because it reminded me on, uh, yeah, because my, my background is the, the urban futures and the scenarios. So I was reviewing a lot of future, uh, future scenarios of urban mobility. And there was an American author who made four scenarios for different cities in the United States. One of them was, I think, for San Francisco, where they said, well, what happens if everything is an open ecosystem and we make everyone use their standards, whatever they want? So they had this very, very enabling environment for autonomous vehicles. And in the end, none of the, uh, none of the vehicles communicated with each other and there was no interaction and it just became the same mess as before, just with a different kind of person behind the or non-person behind the wheel. And I think it's a bit the same for, um, for mass as well. So we have to make sure that or the private, the responsibility of the public sector, and I think this is possible because a lot of governments showed already today, is ecosystem to allow for the right people and the right companies to to jump in, but at the same time also regulate. And that's a very difficult part. And that's something what I would have said to the question before um, from Sebastian, um, because the impact of mobility on our cities is incredibly huge. Cities exist because of mobility in the first place. Like there's no disconnection between these two things. And if we, or the impact of mobility on public space exists in every possible sense, and whenever we improve the mobility, and then now I'm trying to provoke a little bit, uh, as, as worse our mobility is, as more local in 50 minute cities we might have. So, of course, we don't want a bad, uh, bad mobility or we don't want people not to have access and there's economic functioning behind it and the resources and everything. But theoretically, um, we really have to see, do we want the perfect mobility? Do we want to have a mass system which allows us to go with the autonomous vehicles 30 minutes far away from the next, from the last public transport system? And that's not a one answer I have, but I think this is a responsibility of the public sector to provide in the first place a starting point for the private sector to operate, to inter or to share the data, to share their, yeah, the, let's say the interfaces between them. But then in the, in the end, and that goes a little bit to level four of mass, regulate and incentivize and control. And that's very, very difficult because that means we control where people go and where people don't go. And we don't want to do that either. So that's my non. That was a good answer. No, and it, it, I have some personal opinions on that because again, this is very opinion based, and I think the audience will gain value from our own personal insights. So obviously, uh, you know, our responses should be rooted in facts and information we have, but we also have our own personal bias, and I think that makes our interchange and our roundtable very valuable to the audience here. So my personal bias and take on this, so I'll add to what you said, Chiark, is that uh, the the government and the public sector. Uh, and we're seeing this a trend in mass right now. It's moving much more towards an activist role and taking a more of a leadership role. It, it's been, uh, to quote the uh, Adam Smith and the French term, it's been laissez-faire. It's been very hands-off the last five, six years. Uh, it still is more so in the US. To be honest with you, in the US, it continues to be laissez-faire in terms of mass and the interaction of government in enabling uh, digital mobility outcomes. We see a lot of pilot projects coming out of multiple US cities different initiatives at the state level, many programs that are funded by uh, the federal level and different uh, departments of transportation. But at an operational level, we're seeing in mainland Europe, here on the European continent, a much more of an activist role of, I would say, local PTAs, regional public transport authorities, as well as municipalities, regional governments, either going out to tender procurement for mass solutions, one, or at least drafting the requirements and drafting the policies aligned with their sustainable urban mobility plans to insert mass as that digital layer or enabler. Or on the other side of the English Channel in Great Britain, the future mobility zones, which obviously um, it's a bit outside of the uh, SUMP framework now, but the FMZs all have a digital enabler or a um, value proposition for mass. So they realize that mass is going to help achieve these better outcomes and governments are taking more of this leadership role. Now, there has to be 
a uh, an equilibrium though, because in the mask ecosystem, as we've all seen, the audience, I know you have, we have two amongst the four of us, is this um, monopolization. And the monopolization of masks can occur in the public sector or the private sector. So in the private sector, uh, a bit more in the North American market than Europe, and that would be on the part of either TNCs or MSPs who kind of own, maintain, and operate a de facto mask platform for a PTA or a public authority. That's highly problematic. Now, on the other side of the spectrum is perhaps a PTA or a public authority that owns, maintains, and operates a white label solution mask for a uh, you know urban uh, metropolitan region that has its pros and its cons too, but that can become its own monopolization, its own walled garden ecosystem. So I think what we're talking about, Jark, you and I, I think we're in agreement on this, is we have to strike an equilibrium in what is the value of masks to the public sector and citizens, and how can the public sector serve as enablers and orchestrators of multimodality? They don't need to own the entire white label solution or the one app to rule them all, or the super app, which we're seeing proliferating in the Asian market right now, whether it's in China, Southeast Asia, Singapore, Indonesia, because we know that model simply is not going to work in Europe and probably won't work in North America either. But having the, the public sector strike that equilibrium to deliver that digital layer of infrastructure, to bring out the best in multimodality, to one, deliver seamless door-to-door -door journeys, and to deliver mobility access for all. So again, that's my personal bias on that, but I'll close this question out to an audience. Please give us your thoughts and opinions and burning questions on what Jark and I have talked about. But I need to segue into the next question from the audience, which is from Klaus Dahl, which, and I will ask that to Carlos here because it's your turn. Uh, so Carlos, the question is, we learned here in other sessions, the multiple options Mass offers to cities. So Carlos, may this overwhelm them? If yes, what would be a strategy to sort things out for local decision makers? So you have to put on your public sector local decision maker hat, pretend you're an urban planner, and how would you answer that question, basically? <laughs> I know you're not. <laughs> well, you, you are an urban planner, but you're not working in the public sector. So. Yeah. Uh, well, I can I can also direct that to, to autonomous vehicles because uh, there are mass and autonomous vehicles are in kind of a similar position right now. Uh, yeah, that's not uh, my my specialty, but but actually, uh, what I think is that um, this can be uh, really overwhelming. But I think that uh, cities, both for autonomous vehicles and for uh, for mass, uh, establish a set of a set of goals. I think uh, if they um, if they define the goals, they want to uh that will that will help them um uh, different yeah. and the steps to get there and how to integrate those technologies in. um, um the, the other the other aspect i would i would like to mention more probably around autonomous vehicles but probably mass is also uh, involved in that is that um there is a strong need on uh education of uh public authorities New technologies, uh, because you can be overwhelmed if you don't understand what it is. Uh, so I think education is a is a is let's say um, a short term, low cost uh, first step that sh cities to, should uh, should take to uh, to start this path towards the integration of both mass and autonomous vehicles in their cities in the to be, to achieve the best the best goals they can. I don't know if this answered ex exactly the question, but but I think that this this would be a, a, a path and a way forward for for that. Because you use autonomous vehicles, or maybe even shared autonomy as a specific use case and enabler for mass as an individual mode, whether it's uh, you know steady state current or in the future, and how that can achieve more desired outcomes that are consistent with uh, public sector, uh, sustainable urban mobility plans, uh, policies and regulations. So no, I think that was that was a, a, a good good response on your part. Um, so moving on to the next question, because we do still have a series of questions from the audience and the audience takes priority over anything else here, is, uh, and this is for Sebastian, um, this is a bit more um, uh, tech-centric question, which is, 
Sebastian, can an open source system be a solution for an integrated mass network, or do you think it has a limited reach? Thank you. Thank you, Scott, and thank you for, for the question uh, of uh, anonymous question, uh, but really interesting. Well, the thing is, uh, well, open source system, I don't know. It's, I, I think that actually the way mass is integrated uh, really depends on the culture. I, I've been living in China for eight years and well, certainly I've, I've been living with those super apps, which are integrative and that allows to, uh, well, to integrate and pay in once for all those uh, mobility services. Um, I don't think this is applying to Europe or the Western world, let's say. Um, but I, I, I think still uh, the, the, city, the city has a responsibility to understand how mobility can work and, and, how, and how it can be managed. The thing with uh, um, mobility and the rest of the city in general is that the city is by nature an overwhelming amount of information. So um, an open source system, um, well, I always like to to see a potential tool of understanding how mobility works and how it can be managed by by creating what we we would call an urban mobility observatory or even urban observatory. Some cities are are building that. Uh, if you look at the city of Manchester or, or many others, actually they they build a, a city data portal. Uh, of course, it's not only for mobility, but it it allows to gather all the information together and to see uh, what actually is invisible uh, with the eye and without actually tracking people, but really uh, uh, to have a kind of centralized uh, source of information which can be public uh, to some extent, of course. And doing by building an uh, urban mobility observatory for a city, we could be able to uh, have a better understanding of what is overwhelming us at the moment. Um, so that that would be for me uh, a potential starting point. But I wouldn't be, well, at, at least for Europe, I wouldn't be uh, uh, agreeing with a, like a super app uh, integrating all the services together. That, that won't happen. I mean, it's, it's not only cultural, it's well, it's, it's technical. There, there are many aspects uh, uh, behind this. Um, so I'm not a, a specialist in open source system and how it works, but really this is, this is my, my point of view as a planner. And uh, for, for the next, uh, I mean, for the next years and decades in terms of mobility integration and planning and how we understand it, we need to build the knowledge. And to build the knowledge, we need to digitize somehow and create a portal and observatory like this. Um, I think it's, oh, Carlos, please. Yes, if you want to add. Yeah, that. just to add to, uh, to what uh, Sebastian said, um, I think, um, yeah, and, I mean, an open source uh, system is just, a, a, and there is a trade off basically <clears throat> in, uh, uh, if, if there is a private provider, then the provider will take care of the, uh, the servers and the communications and uh, different different things that uh, if a city takes an, an open source system will have to take care by herself. So if she wants to, on, on the other hand, there is the, the possibility to develop new new functionalities or adapt the system to to some local conditions. But but it also comes at a cost. I mean, uh, open source doesn't mean free uh, necessarily, actually. So that's that's what I would just. Uh... Uh, Tiark, did you have any thoughts on this one? Well, in relation to the next question, so I don't know. We can also move on because I think it it relates very close to the data sharing and data standards as well. Okay, we'll uh, we'll segue into that in, in thirty seconds. But my response to this question is, open source doesn't necessarily mean uh, it's mutually exclusive with um, open mobility or open mobility ecosystems. And unfortunately, many times, as Carlos has mentioned, 
there's issues related to um, the commercialization of open source and intellectual property. So it makes it very hard for the private sector to participate in open source ecosystem if they cannot generate a profit. But having more of an open mobility ecosystem that is orchestrated and governed by a public authority that sets the rules of engagement, like you could think of it almost as uh, a uh, European Union in microcosm for mobility at the regional level. If you have that type of construct that uses uh, governance layers of stakeholder communication between public and private sector, then you've built out an open ecosystem or an open mobility marketplace that delivers the same outcomes as an open source platform without preventing private mobility operators, vendors, as well as developers from participating and actually monetizing. Because again, that's gonna deliver the better outcomes for shared mobility is when you incentivize all stakeholders to participate in an ecosystem without just putting in uh, open source data on GitHub and making it free for everyone. That can generate a new set of problems and issues. So, uh, you know, the commercialization as well as the business models need to be considered in terms of how open does this type of solution need to be for urban uh, inhabitants to deliver uh, sustainable urban mobility outcomes? Um, so that was just my thought on that. And then one final point that Sebastian made was, uh, and we talked about this before, which is, uh, yeah, the super app and the one app to rule them all, um, highly problematic, almost uh, virtually non-existent in Europe uh, due to regulatory concerns, due to the role of public and private sectors, and the, it's simply the business model and use case is not scalable in Europe. And even for that matter, in North America, um, it's a bit problematic to have one app rule them all. Whether you wanna take into consideration GDPR or take into consideration statewide level uh, data regulation and other considerations around business models, uh, it, it's a bit hard to even um, wrap your head around that construct, um, at least in the North American continent or Europe. And this is a natural segue to Chiarks next question, which I'm going to feel it's you, given that you're based in France, even though Carlos, you are too, but I think Chark, you should uh, start on this one, which is about data sharing and data standards. What is France actually doing under o LOM? Will this national level standard ultimately help the European Commission form European data standardization and creation of pan-European mass to realize? Yes, thank you. It's a it's a great question because it, it tackles a couple of different parts. It's about the data sharing. That's why I didn't want to react directly to the other one because I think it can be in the same same moment. It's about the standards and it's about the cross country, the international collaboration, and all of them have very very important parts. I would say I, I might disagree with some of your points before because for me, um, the open data is really the first and foremost part which has to be there in order to make any kind of these systems possible. And for me, it's not even that much about standards to make a bit of a spontaneous comparison. Let's say if you throw four people in a room which speak different languages and you force them to speak, uh, most likely they will find some way to uh, communicate with each other. So if you, if everyone has to have an API where people can, or where other companies, where the public sector, private sector, everyone feeds in at least key information, there will be a system which works. And that refers in the same way to the European level or international level, because if if everyone in some, in, if in every place, every private and public entity has to make data available, there will be a system, there will be a standard. This has happened again and again across so many different fields. So of course the standard, I think there, and this is, is I'm not a legal expert for the, the law of the mobility transition from France now. But for me, this is the, the key part there that it needs to be made accessible in a certain way. The standard defines what has to be made accessible and everything else. We don't really know the perfect solution to it either. So there are a lot of good, uh, great pilots around this topic as well. But as long as it's there, there will be a solution found. And this solution is probably um, also in many cases driven by the private sector because they will make their, um, their business cases out of it. I think a challenge is that data is a resource which becomes more and more important. And to make everything open access makes it much more difficult to deal effectively with this. Um, and there, I think a couple of years ago, there was a TED talk in the United States as well, where, they, where the speaker made the, the case that Google could transport people for free through the data and the, the advertisement time and so on they have during the time in the car. So I think the, the question 
for me, it's very clear. It has to be open data, but what is about the value of the data and how can you still keep this into the system? And I think this is something which, which has to be defined, but it should not interfere with the full openness, which will enable the pan-European um, collaboration as well. Thank you. Um, Sebastian, do you have any thoughts on the same question at all? I think you might be muted. <laughs> Yeah, yeah no, I, I have big issues to to hear actually with the sound, so I was going to reconnect. I don't know if you hear me. This it's yeah. I'm going to reconnect. Maybe yeah. I'll... yeah sorry. Because I okay, see. that's fine, Sebastian. Sorry. I'll I'll add my thoughts yeah. to that really fast um, while you reconnect. So. Um, Jark, uh, I think uh, actually we're in agreement, and I think um, in terms of data and standardization, um, yes, there are many legal considerations, and that's why uh, what national level data standards for mobility are being highly considered here in Europe, whether in the Netherlands, certainly Netherlands has taken the lead on that, or as we're mentioning here, the use case in France. Um, there has been um, some reservations or concerns about uh, other data specifications and standardizations that have been developed in the US, such as MDS. And MDS has gone through a number of legal challenges in uh, Los Angeles, even though the uh, legal challenges have been dropped uh, related to personal privacy and data protection. And uh, are these uh, data specifications, the APIs and the attributes uh, incorporated in these APIs, are they consistent with GDPR? And do they affect the goals and outcomes that European cities desire for mass or for shared mobility. So what we see now is kind of a repositioning of some of these uh, data standards. Some of them are being introduced from North America into Europe. Some of them are being, I would say, revised. And some of them are being completely replaced by national level or European level standards uh, that are more aligned with uh, sustainable urban mobility plans and more aligned with uh, human centric approaches to uh, push back on that use case you mentioned about Google, you know, Google owning your data and being able to uh, drive desired monetization outcomes. So uh, this is, again, coming back to the, our topic around governments taking more of an activist role in mass or in standardization of data or in standardization of the communications of how citizenry participate in more of a democratic fashion for equitable access to mobility. So what we have to think about here, or we should, or my biased opinion is, we can't develop standards for the sake of standards. That is a solution looking for a problem. We have to just define our desired outcomes first and the standards, there could be a multitude of standards that interoperate in a mass ecosystem or, or a mobility marketplace that communicate, like the example you mentioned before, multiple languages, someone will find their own language, will be able to drive those desired outcomes. And I think that there's not a one size fits all, but if it's one standard that is trying to impose its will on a particular, I would say, uh, ecosystem or population that is uh, driving the discussion a bit uh, out of sync with the overall sustainable urban mobility goals, then we have a problem. And we have a problem because that's technology for technology's sake and we need to reevaluate our priorities. And that's my personal bias. I've seen it many times in data standardizations in this ecosystem. And um, the story is not finished yet. I think that it's going through a uh, rapid uh, metamorphosis and we're gonna see a lot more change uh, in the future. There's not gonna be, like we said, one app to rule them all. There's not gonna be one standard to rule them all either. And we have to be very open to how this complex ecosystem evolves so that we can better affect the digital and physical realms of infrastructure. And with that, Sebastian, uh, we have a minute or two left. Do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Scott. You're, you're always very inspiring. So I would, I, I, I don't have the, well, the, the golden word to conclude on this because it's, it's, it's really something in progress. But I would say, and this is maybe from my experience in China, that uh, digitization and uh, well, the, the, this this global trend of of mass services uh, emerging in cities should not uniformize uh, or, or just standardize all our cities in the same way. I hope that urban mobility ecosystems will be as diverse 
as transport system and mobility policies have been in European cities. I mean, Munich is not Amsterdam, Amsterdam is not Madrid, and Berlin is not London. And I hope that digitization will not like uh, polish the whole thing to, to have a standardized, uh, uniformized, digitized way of, of thinking cities. So it's really important that each city uh, find its own path. And well, technology is coming like the car was coming and uh, we hope that, yeah, Europe, well, Europe is, is this kind of diversity and I hope it will, it will continue like that. And uh, I'm based in Rome, see that's okay. The position of the cities is already quite clear and very different from what I see in Brussels or Paris. And, uh, and, and that is why I am, I'm happy to, to experience it here. It's a so, great final thoughts, Sebastian. No, I, I appreciate that. I think you guys have heard my uh, final pitch. Uh, Carlos, do you have any final thoughts in terms of what we discussed today? And what is the path forward post-COVID for uh, better, more sustainable cities? Well, I think um, COVID kind of, uh, or the lockdown uh, in those COVID, um, open, up, open up our eyes on, on the of making uh, urban mobility sustainable. Now we have to make suburban mobility sustainable <laughs> because uh, that's the, the forgotten part because of many reasons. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think there, there, there's, a, there's a way for that. Uh, I would also um, yeah, like to kind of agree with you on the sense that uh, is, is there even a need for a, a one app to rule them all uh, for all cities? I mean, uh, this is this is I think uh, something of a very specific use case for uh, business travel. Uh, so people who are traveling for business want to just same app and use them all over Europe or all over the world. And yeah, that can be um, that can be a, an interesting use case. But uh, but in fact, uh, it doesn't apply to to everyday people uh, living in the city. So I think we should focus on, on really making um, a mass and, and also the physical layer of mass and, and, and transportation uh, better in, in all, of, uh, all of what a city really is or a metropolitan area really is. Uh, and yeah, leave the international business case to probably some uh, specific uh, companies, I don't know. But uh, but I think it's um, there is a, a positive uh, way forward, and and with we should take the advantage of what we have seen to to try to keep it uh, that way, the positive what of of what the pandemic brought. Thanks for that. So, Tiar, do you have any uh, final thoughts on what we've discussed today? No, I think also a nice final word. So for me. You good? Okay. So uh, with that, I believe we have gone over time here. So I want to thank the panelists today, uh, Sebastian Chark and Carlos, as well as our support from Victoire for this uh, excellent uh, session on the mass responsive city with urbanism next Europe. Um, we hope maybe the four of us will uh, repeat this in a future session in person uh, after COVID, where we all can all meet in person. But uh, this has been a really exciting session and we're seeing this uh, convergence and emergence of mass into new use cases that support um, sustainable urban mobility as well as are uh, a bit more um, relevant uh, commercially on the private sector as well as relevant for the public sector in positioning themselves as the orchestrators of shared mobility so again thank you uh, panelists for your time today it was a sincere pleasure always great to exchange ideas. It was great to get questions from the audience. We'll try to field any other questions here through the um, hop-in portal. And uh, we appreciate your time and thanks for joining. Have a great day.